Well, good morning. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be with you again, uh, somewhat unexpectedly. Um, and we do pray for Jeff and Julie that they will be able to make a quick recovery. But it is a pleasure to be able to open God's word with you this morning. Uh, my name's Pete, and I'm one of the elders here at the gathering. I, I want to start by asking, a qu- or actually even pointing out, I do believe, I think there should be sermon notes in Mandarin and potentially Thai. So uh, you can try it out, and it may be the notes for this sermon. It may be the notes for a different sermon. It'll be fun either way. I want to start by asking a question. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What are you excited about in your day? What things do you think about first thing in the morning? When you have free time, what do you think about? Sometimes I do a lot of thinking when I'm in the shower. What do you think about? What are your goals? Do you have goals? What are your plans for the next five years, for the next 10 years? What are you willing to put hard work in for? What must you have? What can't you do without? What do you hunger and thirst for? Jesus calls his disciples to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Today, we're going to be looking at one verse from what's called the Beatitudes, or the Eight Blessings. It's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus has taken uh, his followers away, and there's a crowd listening to him teach. And this is just one of the blessings that he talks about. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So today we're going to look at four parts. What does it mean to hunger and thirst? What is the righteousness that Jesus is referring to? What does it mean to be satisfied? And what can we do to grow in hunger, hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Now, it's important to note as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, but especially the Beatitudes, is that this section of Scripture is about how to live as saved people. He's not talking about how to be saved. These are descriptions of what believers saved by grace should live like. It's about sanctification, not justification. Uh, A quote I found said that the law sends us to Christ to be justified and Christ sends us back to the law to be sanctified. In this message, we will, of course, talk about salvation, but the main point is for Christians, after you have been saved, how are you to live? How are we to grow and mature? And uh, the Beatitudes helps, help us. Another thing to point out with these blessings, what does it mean to be blessed? Some translations say, happy are those. And it does include the idea of happy, but it's not just describing a feeling. It's not just a subjective feeling that a person might have that they feel happy, but it's an objective fact of how God sees them. They are blessed. Now, the, the, the original term refers to wholeness, completeness, uh, shalom. It's peace, wholeness, fulfillment. And that is the blessing that it is referred to. So what does it mean to hunger and thirst? Have you ever been hungry? Now, you might be tempted to look at me and think that guy has never been hungry. I have. Uh, When you are hungry, it consumes you. You can't do anything else. You must eat. In fact, sometimes thirst is worse than that. We tend to feel thirst more quickly. Think of a time you've been really thirsty. Uh, I can remember a time as a teenager uh, 
a group of friends and I had climbed the highest mountain in Western Australia, where I'm from, um, and it's not very high. Um, anyway, our, our country is flat. But we'd, it was a hot day, and we'd, we'd climbed to this, this highest point, and we didn't bring any water with us. And then we'd climbed down, and I, I remember we were so thirsty, and it was kind of a, a, remote, a remote place. And I looked around, and there was actually a group of French tourists in the distance. And I remember trying to remember my eighth grade French class. How do you say water? How do I, how do I ask for this? Um, I remember we were looking around the trash cans to see if there were any half-drunk bottles of anything so we could find something to drink. When you're thirsty like that, you will drink anything. You'll do anything to get satisfaction of that thirst. Some of you may, may even be familiar with that story that's in the movie Alive and people have been in a plane crash and they're stranded in the mountains and they're desperate for food and how they satisfy their hunger. Have you ever felt hungry or thirsty like that? That is how Jesus urges us to feel about righteousness. We are meant to have that desire, that urgency for righteousness. You see, the more we desire righteousness the less we will sin. We sin because we desire something else more than righteousness. When we lie, it's because we believe whatever that lie will bring us is greater than righteousness. But when we hunger and thirst, it shows that we, we don't have that thing. We want it. To grow in our spiritual maturity, to grow in righteousness, we have to want it. You see, we're like a bucket with a hole in it. Water pours in, but it also drains out. Unless we keep hungering for more, eventually it'll disappear. Hungering for righteousness can be like an addictive drug in a good way. When we have a little bit, it causes us to want more of it. Uh, the psalmist says this, "'Taste and see that the Lord is good.'" Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Experiencing the goodness of the righteous one towards us should make us desire more of the righteous one and more righteousness. We're meant to taste and see how good God is so that we will hunger more for him. You see, we are swimming upstream in our fight against the world. In our fight against the world, the flesh and the devil. To do nothing is to float backwards. Or it's like being in a, a shopping mall and there are escalators and you're trying to run up the down escalator. You have to work very, very hard to get up, otherwise you just fall backwards. And that's what it's like for us with righteousness. What other things do we hunger and thirst for? Whatever they are, they won't satisfy. What, what we hunger for, we will do whatever we can to get it. But only righteousness will satisfy. The world hungers for material things, worldly things, but God's people are told to hunger for spiritual things. Uh, I've already made a joke about my lack of fitness, but sometimes I'm, I'm tempted to use scripture to justify my lack of exercise. For those of you who don't like exercise so much, you can use this. I see someone exercising and I say, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Now, I say that as, as a joke. Actually, both, both are good. Um, but we should be asking the question, what do we desire most? Uh, those that are fit and healthy, uh, are you putting more effort into your physical body than you are into your spiritual state? What do we desire most? Do we desire our godliness? And actually, for those of us that are on the other side that are not exercising, perhaps we need to ask ourselves, do we desire ease and comfort and laziness more than godliness? Because it's the same problem. What do, we really, what do we really hunger for for our children? 
How do our actions show what we care most about? How do your children experience you? Do they see that you care most about their grades? Do they see that you care most about their sporting success or their musical abilities? Uh, just this weekend, my daughter has been competing in a basketball tournament, and I, I was watching the games live streamed on, online, and I found myself getting so worked up, so emo emotional. I cared so much how well she did and how well her team did. And it struck me as I was reflecting on this, do I hunger that way for her righteousness? Do I hunger that way for my own righteousness? Matthew 6, 31 to 33 says this, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus urges us to seek his kingdom and his righteousness above everything else that we might seek. What is the righteousness we are to hunger for? When it says righteousness, what does it mean? Is it talking about our righteousness? Is it talking about righteousness in people around us? I looked up a uh, Bible dictionary. And the Vines Bible Dictionary says this. It's, Righteousness is an attribute of God. It's the same, uh, an attribute of God. <laughs> it's the same as his faithfulness or truthfulness. And it's that which is consistent with his own nature and promises. Whatever is right or just in itself, whatever conforms to the revealed will of God, whatever has been appointed by God to be acknowledged and obeyed by man, that is righteousness. Righteousness also refers to the gospel. Uh, Hebrews 5.13 says this, Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. What is the teaching about righteousness? The teaching about righteousness is the gospel. That is, we cannot gain righteousness by ourselves. We need Jesus to do it for us. Righteousness has three aspects. And actually, that, that aspect of what I'm saying, Jesus needs to do it for us, is talking about the first one. There's legal righteousness, moral righteousness, and social righteousness. So there are three. Legal righteousness is justification, a right relationship with God. Some passages that point this out. Peter writes, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everyone obtains a standard uh, standing before God because of the righteousness of Christ, those that put their faith in him. And 1 Peter 3.18 says this, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Because of what Christ has done for us, uh, before God, we are legally righteous. We are justified. That is, God declares that we are free from the eternal consequences of our sin. We are declared innocent. And it's not that we have not sinned, but that the sentence that we should receive has been carried out on Jesus. And the result is there is no barrier between us and God. We can know with certainty that when we put our trust in Jesus now, and also when we die and stand before God, he will accept us. We are completely acceptable to God because of the righteousness that we receive from Christ. We are to hunger for this kind of right relationship with God that comes through Jesus Christ. The next kind of righteousness is moral righteousness. And a commentator said this, it's the righteousness of character and con conduct which pleases God. Jesus goes on after the Beatitudes to contrast this Christian righteousness with the righteousness of the Pharisees. The Pharisees had an external conformity to rules. The former is an inner righteousness of heart, mind, and motive. 
For this we should hunger and thirst. Moral righteousness is our own good behavior which is pleasing to God. We should hunger for that in ourselves and others. This is a kind of righteousness that we can grow in through our own effort in cooperation with the Holy Spirit that works in us. This is what Christians talk about as sanctification. Do we hunger to please God? Do you want to see other people please God? Husbands are to love their wives that way. Is that how we pray for our wives? Look at this well-known passage in Ephesians 5. It's talking about Christ and the church, but talking about how husbands are to love their wives. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This verse shows a husband's desire should be to work toward the righteousness of his wife. But I think it's also a principle that can apply to all kinds of relationships. If we are to love other people like Christ has loved other people, we will want to see them grow in their godliness and in their good behavior. Do we also desire that for ourselves, to always behave in a way that is good, right, pure, and holy? Not only outwardly to be seen by others, but in our thoughts and our motivations. And then the third kind of righteousness is social righteousness. And a commentator said this, As we learn from the law and the prophets, social righteousness is concerned with seeking people's liberation from oppression, together with the promotion of civil rights, justice in the law courts, integrity in business dealings, honor in home and family affairs. Christians are committed to hunger for righteousness in the whole human community as something pleasing to a righteous God. We are to hunger for whatever pleases God in society. Good behavior done because of pride or fear is tainted by sin. Righteousness is good behavior done to please God. And we can please God with our behavior. Now, often at the gathering, we emphasize our sinfulness and our need for grace. And it can give the impression that we can never please God. But I want to say we can never do enough to earn our salvation. But the Bible does say that we can do things that are pleasing to Him. Here are some passages. Colossians 1, 9 to 10 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is possible. We are urged to pursue this. And another passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. We can walk in ways that are pleasing to God, and this should be our aim. This should be what we hunger and thirst for. Timothy Keller points out that after we become a Christian, we will continue to battle against our old motivation for doing good things. Our old motivations are either fear and pride. And perhaps we will never be completely free from those motivations until the new creation. But we can grow. We can do more and more good just because it's pleasing to God. And it's right in these verses that we see it's talking about our righteousness and other people's righteousness as well. But we should also hunger and thirst for the righteous one, that is Jesus. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told? The father wanted to, to give to his sons himself. 
The father was delighted that his son came back and had a celebration with him because he, he missed him. He wanted to be in relationship with him. And the older brother, he wanted him to come inside to the party and said, everything that I've had has always been yours. You have this opportunity to, to enjoy a relationship with me all the time. Our heavenly father is like that. He desires to give us himself. And so we're to hunger and thirst after the righteous one. Psalm 37 verse 4 says this, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, these are not two separate halves of the one verse. It's not saying if you really desire a brand new Ferrari, if you take delight in the Lord, you will get a Ferrari. He's saying if you take delight in the Lord, that is the thing that you desire. If you take delight in the Lord, he will give you himself. He will satisfy you with himself. If our experience in our relationship with God is that it is distant, we need to ask ourselves, are we seeking to take joy and satisfaction in him above all else? One of my favorite kinds of prayers is one of, do you remember the father that was coming to Jesus about his child. And Jesus said, uh, he said to him, if you want to, you can heal. And um, I think that's how it goes. Anyway, Jesus said, you know, do you, do you believe? And the father said, I believe, help my unbelief. And I love to pray that prayer. Father, I desire you. Help my lack of desire. I need to grow in desiring you more. What does it mean to be satisfied? Only the righteous one can truly satisfy us. When will we be satisfied? Now, but not fully until Christ returns. See, God has promised a day of judgment in which right will triumph and wrong will be overthrown, and after which there will be new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we long for, that new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. That's what we are to hunger and thirst for, and it will be satisfied at the end. But we also get to enjoy satisfaction now. We get the first fruits now, but the harvest will be later. Have you ever had the feeling of being satisfied with God, enjoying Him, enjoying the feeling of being loved by Him? How long did that feeling last? For me, I've had times and seasons where it comes and it goes. I would have to say most of, the, most of my experience is not that closeness and satisfaction in God, though there are times when it has been. But one day we will be completely satisfied in our relationship with God. There will be no coming and going. There will only be growing and growing. That's something we can look forward to. All of the satisfaction that we receive in this life, whether it's satisfaction in God or even satisfaction in worldly things, is only ever temporary. In marketing, they talk about post-purchase dissonance, where they've realized it doesn't matter what, when a customer buys a product, after they've made that purchase, they instantly feel some regret or lack of satisfaction in the purchase, no matter what the purchase is. So marketers now develop strategies to hit people with something else good uh, after they've made the, the promise. So Apple is famous for that. They don't necessarily advertise all their features and then offer features after you've bought a product to try and counter that post-purchase dissonance. Nothing we have now will ever satisfy us. But even that sense of fleeting, limited satisfaction can be appointed to us that ultimately there is greater satisfaction to be had. One day, our hunger and thirst for righteousness will be completely satisfied. Again and again, Scripture addresses its promises to the hungry. God satisfies those who are thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. If we are conscious of our slow growth 
in spiritual maturity is the reason that our appetites are wrong. It's not enough to mourn over past sin, but we must also hunger for future righteousness. How can we do this? How can we grow in our hunger for righteousness? I want to finish just with some practical applications of things that we might do to, to grow in our hunger and thirst for righteousness. To change our behavior, so to change our own moral righteousness, we need to change our desires, and that's what we've been saying. Uh, many different religions or philosophies say that desires are wrong. I'm, I'm not an expert in Buddhism or Taoism, but I know both of those belief systems point to desire being behind many of the world's problems. In Buddhism, and many of you probably understand this much better than I do, but this is my search on Wikipedia, said this. Buddhism talks about the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots, and these are ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And these three poisons are considered to be the cause of suffering. Attachment, desiring something, wanting something, is seen as the cause of all suffering. Christianity doesn't completely disagree, but there is a key difference. Christianity says that our problem is that we are desiring the wrong things, and we don't desire the right things enough. So we agree with Buddhism that many, much suffering is caused by the wrong kinds of desires. In fact, 2 Peter says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. It's sinful desire that has led to corruption in this world. We need our desires to be transformed. So what can we do? How can we increase our hunger? One thing we've already mentioned is to taste now. Taste now and see that the Lord is good. Find ways to focus on seeing how wonderful God is. See his beauty. See his desirability. Be intentional about where our thoughts go. I was having a conversation even uh, just before the service and was reminded, thank God about the good things that we experience. We so easily pray for something and then forget about it and, then, and forget about the good, goodness of God. Stopping to thank him for the good things that he's done helps us realize how wonderful he is and helps us to, to desire him. We can ask for help. We can pray. We can pray that prayer. I do want you, God. I want your righteousness. Help me to want it more. Help me to want it more than everything else. We can ask others to pray for us. We can fight to cut off our competing desires. We can seek to not feed them. We can make them submit to us. We can wean ourselves from, from false things. I heard another sermon about uh, a guy who would once a week have a freezing cold shower and force himself to stay in there for a minute. And uh, apparently he said it's because he wants to teach his body who's boss. Everything in his body is saying get out of that cold water, but he wants his will to be in charge of his body to know that it's a way of even saying, my sinful desires are not what rules me. I can make decisions to not feed those desires. There are spiritual disciplines that are often neglected in the church, or maybe not completely, but in parts of the church. Fasting is a spiritual discipline that, amongst other things, can teach us to hunger for God. When was the last time you fasted and prayed? We can do things to feed our righteous desires. Uh, the old adage that comes from computer programming is garbage in, garbage out. But it's the same in, in our lives. What are we watching? What are we listening to? 
Is it something that will feed righteousness or is it something that will feed us in a different direction? I think I, 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 was, I was reflecting on this uh, in the car on the way here. I was thinking, oh, gee, I only prepared, I only looked at this message in a, in a short time preparing and I, I was just looking back on the way that I've lived this week. And I, I said to my daughter, I feel like such a hypocrite talking about this message today. When I think back on what are the things that I've listened to? What are the podcasts that I've listened to this week? Not bad things, but just not things that caused me to grow and hunger in righteousness. One of the times of my greatest spiritual growth was uh, when I lived in another country that had terrible uh, traffic problems. And twice a week, I had to catch public transport out to a school to do some lessons. And it was uh, two hours each way. So I would spend four hours sitting on public transport. And I just, I had an iPod back then. I filled up my iPod with sermons and messages. And I just spent that time listening to uplifting things. My life was transformed. And now that I'm not having to catch a bus for two hours, I don't listen to that kind of material anywhere near as much. How can we feed our desires for righteousness? Philippians 4.8 says this, uh, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Let's do that. That's what we can do to grow in our sanctification. Now, anytime I talk about what we can do, I'm reminded of how easy it is for us to listen to the voice of our enemy who then just condemns us because of what we haven't done. So even as I'm talking about all the things that we can do in our growth in sanctification, we can't remember, uh, we can't forget what Jesus has done for us. He died for us precisely because of the ways that we fall short in these areas. We have been completely justified and made righteous before God. We have that legal justification because of what Jesus has done. So anytime you start thinking, oh, I, I haven't done those things that I can to grow in my sanctification, first remember what Jesus has done, that you are right as you stand before him, that he loves you deeply, and that can be a motivation to grow in the sanctification. We can encourage one another. We can be examples to one another. We can spend time with people that we see are growing in holiness. These are things that we can do. I'll skip that one. I want to finish by reading what a commentator said about this beatitude and these beatitudes. He, he said that each step is a progression and it leads to the next one. To begin with, Jesus urges us to be poor in spirit, acknowledging our complete and utter spiritual bankruptcy before God. Next, we are to mourn over the cause of it. Our sin, yes. And our sin too, the corruption of our fallen nature and the reign of sin and death in the world. Thirdly, we are to be meek, humble and gentle towards others, allowing our spiritual poverty to impact our behavior to them as well as to God. And fourthly, we are to hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what is the use of confessing and lamenting our sin, of acknowledging the truth about ourselves to both God and men, if we leave it there? Confession of sin must lead to hunger for righteousness. So what have we seen, to, what have we seen this morning in this one verse? We are to desire righteousness above all else. We are to desire right standing before God, right behavior in ourselves and others, and right behavior in society. Most of all, we are to desire the righteous one who loves us and wants to give himself to us. We are to look forward to the ultimate satisfaction that will come when everything is made new. But we are also to look for our satisfaction in Christ right now. We've seen that changing our desires is key and that we can help and encourage one another in this. Let's pray together.
Dear Heavenly Father, we do cry out to you and say, we long for you and your righteousness. We hunger and thirst for your righteousness. We long to see ourselves transformed and those around us transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. But we also admit we don't desire it completely, fully, or consistently. Cause us to desire you and your righteousness more and more above all else. We need your help. Heavenly Father, please will you use us to be a blessing to those around us. May we encourage one another. Lord, protect us from any condemnation from the evil one. Help us to always remember that you have won our righteousness and you have forgiven us. Help us to be motivated by your love for us as we strive to grow in our own righteousness. Thank you that one day you will bring it to completion. Thank you that one day all our longings will be fully satisfied in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.